No polls. No pundits. Just vibes. And the vibes this week. This is really the most consequential abortion case to come before the Supreme Court since this court overturned Roe v. Wade back in 2022. That's the case involving Mifepristone, or the abortion pill as it's known, which the Supreme Court heard this week. We'll talk about the case and how it made its way up to the high court and how justices reacted to oral arguments. And? I, I find the decision to put her on the payroll ex inexplicable. And I, and I hope they will reverse their decision. It seems they've done just that. That, by the way, was Rachel Maddow on NBC's decision to hire Rona McDaniel. We'll talk about the whirlwind week for the network and the election denying former RNC chair. Then we'll give you a Trump date on a few of the trials the former president is facing. Stick around for It's Giving, our group chat convo, and a good vibe to carry through the week. Let's get into it. Well, Brian, I didn't think we'd be talking about my favorite topic first thing, but here we are again, SCOTUS. Back, back, back again. Currently in front of the Supreme Court, we have potentially, I would argue, the most important case on abortion since Roe v. Wade. Right. Potentially. Why do you say, why do you say that? I well, agree, by the way, but for the audience. So Dobbs was the decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, and obviously you can't sort of overstate the importance of that ruling, which has totally transformed our political landscape and caused real world harm to millions of people. Today's case is specifically about mifepristone mm -hmm. and the FDA's approval of that drug, which is, according to the most recent data, now used in 63% of all abortions. So most abortions use abortion medication and mifepristone is the most common medication. If today's ruling rolls back mifepristone, it's not just doing it in red states, it's doing it nationally. It's nationally. Everywhere. It's essentially a national ban. And for those who don't know, if you want an abortion, there's two ways that you can do it. One, you can have a surgical operation or you can have a self-managed abortion, which is when you take medication at home, or you can take it in a healthcare clinic. And this is one of the pills that you would take to do that. So essentially, it would outlaw this pill, making it virtually impossible to have a self-managed abortion. That would be like the most dramatic outcome possible, right? Would be if they reverse the FDA's approval of mifepristone, which it's been on the market for 20, almost 25 years. Right. It's like an incredibly safe drug, but they've manufactured this case to say that it shouldn't be allowed. And the most dramatic outcome would be that they restricted access entirely, but also it could just be rolled back where they refuse to allow it to be mailed using something like the Comstock Act, which we okay. can get into. But like they could say, you're not allowed to mail this. It has to be prescribed in person. They could ban telehealth medicine visits. They could, there are many ways mm -hmm. that they could restrict access without entirely banning the drug. But according to oral arguments, which we've talked about this before, oral arguments are just sort of like a vibes check based on the mm -hmm. questions that people are asking. It seemed like the justices, conservative and captured as they are, were skeptical of the yeah. argument that this, this drug needed to be restricted. And a lot of them were questioning whether the plaintiffs, the conservatives who manufactured this case, actually had standing to sue in the first place. Right. And, you know, what I was thinking about today is, you know, there's I see on the subway here in New York, like all of these ads for like hymns, right, which is, you know, uh, mail order uh, Viagra, ED right? Medication, right? Yeah. And it's like, well, this isn't really about the access to the abortion pill. It's about control over women's bodies, essentially. We, we are well on our way to... Um... <laughs> the Glennis Mahar nomination for Supreme Court justice, because you just nailed what KBJ's argument was, which is, do we really want courts to be the ones deciding what drugs are and are not safe for the public? Because usually it's like boards of certified professionals right. who understand like advanced pharmaceutical science who are making those kinds of judgments. Do we right. really want every individual drug, exactly like you're saying, like ED medication to go before a court of justices to have them decide whether we should have access? Yeah. And I think we can all collectively say, no, no, we do not. Uh, maybe some drugs, I guess, but no, 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 yeah. no, actually, actually none. Actually, I'm none. good with them deciding on none. I think that it's a it's a healthcare decision that I do not trust 
Clarence Thomas, your your buddy. I don't trust him with that at all. For sure. It goes back to, you know, two months ago, we were talking about the Chevron deference and what that would do if we consolidated power to the Supreme Court and how government agencies that have hired, you know, subject matter experts who make decisions on policy. We we don't want that either because we want those subject matter experts advising the policy, not the Supreme Court. So this is just like a larger, you know, example of the consolidation of power and and again, for me, this I view this as a control over women's bodies. That an actual let's look at this drug and see if it's safe or not. 100%. So fun fact, if you didn't catch it, one of the lawyers arguing in favor of restricting access to mifepristone is Missouri US senators Josh Hawley's wife. Her name is Erin Hawley, and she's like a big deal in the far right and to group for groups like Alliance Defending Freedom, who are pushing this really far right agenda. And the New York Times did a profile of her because she's arguing this case. And I have to tell you that I was tickled <laughs> by this quote t- talking about her and how this case was, quote, similar to her fights against government interference rooted in her experience of ranch life. Huh? And I was like, wait a second. How on earth is this case rooted in your fight against government interference. This is the definition totally. of government overreach to have them run back 25 years and ban something because they don't like it and they took power that they didn't have before. That's absolutely, absolutely bonkers. And I like that really, I was shook. It also, I mean, th- just the name Alliance Defending Freedom. Freedom for who and from what? Or for well, what? Like, I'm sorry, not, come again? Not queer people. ADF is like, people should recognize ADF from all of the anti-LGBT stuff that they push in front of the courts. It's them and the Family Research Council mm. and a few other groups who really scour the country looking for plaintiffs, looking for people who will have mm. standing or potentially have standing to sue so that they can try to get the most restrictive rulings in the most conservative courts. We have to remember that this case came from Kazmark, which mm-hmm. is the ultimate right-wing judicial shopping target in Texas. It's this like rural district where if you file in this specific place, you're guaranteed to get this specific judge. And that is who originally issued a ruling mm-hmm. on Mifepristone that led to this case being in front of the Supreme Court. To that point, it is a hyper, hyper decades long coordinated movement. This is not just like one day the Supreme Court was like, we're going to hear this case about this abortion pill. No, this was targeted. They found the judge they knew would rule in their favor and they took that case there and it went up the chain. So I I just don't want people to forget that this is not just a one-off. It is a very well coordinated conservative movement against basic human rights for Americans. Precisely. And I will add some a silver lining here. Mm, um, thank for you. those who follow me on Instagram, you've definitely heard me talk about this in the last couple of weeks, but the Judicial Conference of the United States has since issued a new guideline that will make the kind of, kind of judicial shopping that gave us this case impossible in the future, or at least much, 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 much less likely, where you will no longer be able to pick which federal judge you want to hear your case by by geography. Now it will be randomly assigned within a certain like sub circuit kind of thing. And so yeah. no more. Yeah. Sorry, no ADF. Loss. Yeah, that was major. You did you did do that Instagram post. And it was actually something that I had never heard of. So I appreciate you doing that the Lord's work there. Those are the kinds of battles for democracy that we like have to be vigilant on because they have a deep bench of lawyers and political operatives that are funded by dark money groups, like the Mm -hmm. billion plus dollars that Leonard Leo just got. Mm -hmm. And that's all they do is sit around and look for like how they can game the system to rule as a far right wing minority. And we have to be on top of it. And so this was an incredible move by DOJ pushing the judicial conferences to do this. They made the change. And now moving forward, we can expect better rulings as a result. And I hope that we don't see another case like this that's so obviously politically motivated in front of the court again soon. Period. Period. 
Okay, Brian, there was big news at NBC Networks this past week. The waves, the the boat was a rockin' because Rona McDaniel came a knocking. I know you took it out of my mouth. You took the fun out of my mouth. So okay, let's get into this because it is a little like, huh? What was that? higher what were you thinking there in that boardroom when you made that decision nbc news carrie brown announced the hiring of the former rnc chair to the network she wrote in a staff memo it couldn't be a more important moment to have a voice like rona's on the team a liar literally a liar it doesn't make any kind of journalistic sense to me i do understand and we talk about this uh on the pod there is a importance of having opinions that are not your own and having discussions with those people and having you know an understanding of like fair communication and like whatever but like she lied about the election right and so for people who are not getting the drama or who don't see the other side of it in the inverse direction like rona mcdaniel is a controversial figure she's been the head of the rnc of the republican national committee for many years. She's overseen their losses in 2018 when they lost, in 2020 when they lost, in 2022 when they lost, in 2023 when they lost. She's overseen a lot of losses and therefore she became a punching bag. And Trump pushed her out once he secured the nomination. He said, you're going to go and I'm going to bring in some sycophants who will do what I want and hand me the, the cash basically. Yeah. And this and is part of a larger, yeah. a larger like culling he did at the RNC. Right. Correct. Where he just won the nomination and he was like, you're all out or you have to reapply for your jobs because I want my people ass in seats doing what I want them to do. Right. And he wanted to cut the overhead because the, he, mm. he sees the RNC as just a way to funnel money into his own operations and to legal pay, bills, pay his legal expenses, yeah. <laughs> which he has spent $76 million on in the last two years. Um, and so Rona was left unemployed. <laughs> In, the, in this economy, how could she? The yeah, unemployment's like the lowest it's been in 50 years. But she was unemployed. And so NBC came along and picked her up and said, why don't we pay you $300,000 a year for you to occasionally appear on TV and spew your, and like, and give your opinion, let's be fair, and, and give your political perspective, because that's the job of a paid contributor. Many contributors right. on these platforms that you see are not paid. But and they do have Michael Steele currently, I believe, as a contributor, and he is the former, former, former like RNC chair from many moons ago. Grand um, puppy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Michael, but like, you know, an old timer. So maybe right. they thought that it would land with the NBC community. And so that brings us to your point about who are the right people who should be in these seats, like who who should be representing because there should be a Trump supporter, uh, like sure. speaking and, and representing that perspective of tens of millions of Americans right. on the, the show. Mm -hmm. I think what has caused so much outrage and what we've heard from every single NBC host over the last 72 hours is that there are plenty of people who represent that wing of the party yeah. who did not actively aid and abet fake elector schemes and illegal plots that overstepped right. from pushback and audits into criminal attempts to overturn elections where she is on the record supporting those efforts. And so to hire not just someone who echoed Trump's lies, but actively participated in the attempt to undermine the 2020 election is like totally. antithetical to what NBC claims that they are about, which is like fair and honest reporting. Totally. Allegedly. There's some quotes that uh, we have to prove the summer seats, as we call them. In what they be the saying, industry. what they be saying. So at one point she said that Cheney and Kinzinger crossed the line when joining the January 6 hearings and said they chose to join Nancy Pelosi and a Democrat led persecution of ordinary citizens who engaged in legitimate political discourse that had nothing to do with violence at the Capitol. No, it was violence at the Capitol. That that was what happened. There was no political discourse when they were singing Hang Mike Pence. Right. Unfortunately um, for her, we have eyes and TV subscriptions. So Yeah, that you could I watched live on MSNBC. <laughs> yeah, like what? On a call with Trump and Michigan election officials in 2020 when Trump pressured them not to certify, McDaniel said, If you can go home tonight, do not sign it. We will get you attorneys. Which is like a wink wink, nudge nudge. Don't certify the election. We've got you covered. Right. I mean, she acknowledged that the RNC helped put the slates of fake electors together. Yes. Um, 
And I feel like that is exactly why there's been rightfully so much pushback. It feels really gaslighty, you know, like to have NBC telling us about like the horrors of January 6th and reporting on, you know, how bad it is for democracy and then to give someone a $300,000 a year contract to talk about their role. Um, No, we see you, NBC. So things really started sparking when she appeared on NBC. Do you disagree with Trump saying he's going to free those who've been charged? I do not think people who committed violent acts on January 6th should be freed. So you disagree with that? He's been saying that for months. Rana, why not speak out earlier? Why just speak out about that now? When you're the RNC chair, you, you kind of take one for the whole team, right? Now I get to be a little bit more myself, right? This is what I believe. She's saying the quiet part out loud. Wait, that's horrendous. Horrendous. When you're RNC chair, what? When you're, uh, so essentially what she's saying, she's claiming that being RNC chair would basically justify her engaging in potentially criminal, but at a minimum, but at a minimum immoral acts in order to advance the needs of her party and of her candidate being Donald Trump. And so she's really trying to imply like, oh, I never believed in the first place. That was part of my job. And it should Mm. never be part of someone's job working in the political establishment (laughs) to like work against the interests of the United States and against the constitution. That's on its face. And the American people. Right. Yeah. Yikes. Not great. And then, you know, there was silence from NBC Universal and the anchors took it upon themselves to just start digging into NBC Universal. In this instance, NBC News, either wittingly or unwittingly, is teaching election deniers that what they can do stretches well beyond appearing on our air in interviews, but that they can do that as one of us, as badge-carrying employees of NBC News. It's saying that we have to entertain the idea that the election was stolen on an equal level as we entertain the idea that we should be a multiracial democracy, that these things should be made equal so we're being quote-unquote fair. That is not fairness and balance. That is capitulating to an autocrat in advance by saying, yes, we will take your apparatchik and allow them to be elevated and platformed with us. This isn't about Republicans versus Democrats. This isn't about red versus blue. This is about truth versus lies. Service to the country versus service to one man committed to toppling our democratic system. That is the type of experience that Ronna McDaniel brings to the table. We hope NBC will reconsider its decision. It was literally, it was fight night. Like every hour on the hour, we had a new person going (laughs) off on NBC leadership and executives for how poorly they've handled the situation. But we have kind of a breaking news update. NBC News plans to drop ex-RNC chair Ronna McDaniel as a paid contributor. Wait, I'm finding this out live. <laughs> oh, you are? I thought Yeah, you knew I this. did not know that. Yeah, the execs are deliberating over details. Announcement is pending, and meanwhile, McDaniel is seeking legal representation. Oh my god, they're gonna get they're gonna give her a golden parachute. For sure. They're, they're gonna, gonna be like, let's contract. settle. That's so infuriating. But you know what? Maybe it'll just be like a her year contract. Like there was I mean th- there were so damages. Again, right. I'm not a lawyer, but I don't need to be to be on the Supreme Court. Ugh. But there's there's no bye. See ya. Like I mean, yes, bye. It, first and foremost, it is good news. It makes me angry that she's going to profit from it, but it is good news that she will not have the platform to like, and it sets a good precedent. I think that these people who actively engaged and helped the insurrection should not be considered part of the political mainstream, even as representatives of the right. Now, do, does she go to like X and get a streaming deal with Elon, you know? I I think she's kind of toxic on the right too. Okay, good. Because she's so bad at her job. That's like the other thing. <laughs> that's like the thing right. that we're not saying is she's like terrible. She was a terrible RNC chair. The right. RNC is like the has the worst fundraising they've had in years. They've lost every single major election in the last six years. Um, yeah. Like she's not good. So yeah, I don't know where she's gonna. Maybe she will be unemployed. But thank thankfully for her, the safety net is stronger today than it was four years ago. Thanks mm. to Joe Biden. Thanks to Joe Biden. And thanks if, to everyone for speaking up so that she so she 
got booted. Yeah. Um, wow. We're going to end all of these really like intense stories on a high, which I'm yeah. definitely here for. Yeah. So later. See you later, McDaniel. You do keep me sane with the Trump stuff because it's I get a news alert maybe like every day about it and I don't know what which case we're on. I don't know what's going on. Um, there's only a couple that I know we need to actually care about. Uh, these are two of them we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Honestly, I was thinking over the weekend, I was like, do we need a new podcast segment just called Yup? And it's us just saying stuff that we've already said is going to happen. And then it happens. And then we just say, yup. Yup. <laughs> because yesterday Trump had $454 million due. It was the deadline of all deadlines. And then at the last second. Yep. Oh, <laughs> I said it naturally. <laughs> he gets away with it because of course he does. Instead of paying $454 million, like or put it, putting up $454 million, which like he was supposed to do, the court just decided $175 million will do and gave him 10 extra days to get it. He like cried poverty. He said, oh, we can't get 454 million. We asked all these people and they wouldn't help us. We asked all these bonds and they wouldn't help us with 454 million. So we can't do it. And so you've given us a thing that's impossible. And the court kind of accepted that is my understanding okay. of it. I'm not a bankruptcy or whatever attorney, We're not, but, yeah, um, and they instead said, you need to put up 175 million and you have an extra 10 days. And he's totally gonna be able to do that. So no. So he has an extra 10 days for the 175. Correct. And okay. that means that Tish James, who was literally outside of Trump Tower with the paperwork ready to take it over, yeah. is not going to be putting liens on his properties. We're not going to have an episode of repo men where they take back right. all of Trump's properties. Unfortunately, that's not what we're headed for this year. He's probably going to post this and then he's going to continue appealing this decision yeah. to see if he can get it reversed entirely so he doesn't owe anything and like gets to keep even the 175. But we won't know that for many months. I don't, maybe years. I don't know. Well, that's disappointing. It is, it is disappointing. I was pissed, but he's a slippery snake. I know. And we've know. said all along, I like try not to get my hopes up because we've said always like all along that we have to hold Trump accountable at the ballot box because we cannot yeah. count on these cases to do it. Yeah, he's um, basically like a business grifter. So he's grifting his way through the legal grift. system as well. Another trial, the hush money trial. This is a this is when he will be the first former president to face criminal trial. Right. April 15th. <clears throat> so um, out of the four criminal trials, federal Mar-a-Lago, federal January 6th, Georgia, election interference and New York election campaign finance violation. This is the New York campaign finance violation where he paid all this money to Stormy Daniels and then Stormy. like lied about it and all kinds of other stuff that complicated it as a criminal endeavor. Yeah, he asked for a postponement, a significant postponement, because Trump's lawyer said that the 100,000 pages of potential evidence is just it's too much. It's it's. They need the postponement to read the papers. Which You've is had like, no. the papers. You have the papers. Also, hire people. Hire people. ChatGPT is available. Um, yeah. No, so they did set a trial date April 15th, one week after the eclipse. Things are going to get even spookier. And we'll see. I mean, we'll see if it holds because as we just noted, things have a way of collapsing. The, the justice system has a way of bending around Trump to, to fit his will, but if all goes well, we will officially be on our way with a yeah. criminal trial against our former president for the first time in American history. And this is breaking news also at time of recording is that the, the judge did put a gag order on Trump saying you cannot talk about any upcoming witnesses oh. related to this hush money payment. So let's see if Donald listens to the, the judge and shuts up. Famously a good listener. How do you think that this is going to impact the race? Because that's probably what matters more than anything at this point, if he has to pass to the 
path to the White House. It's kind of, it's not actually funny, but it's funny that there has to be so many cases for people to finally be like, mm, maybe he he is a, a criminal. Half of the country believes that Trump is guilty in the in this uh, case, in the, in the hush money payment. 44% said that a conviction in Manhattan would have no impact on their likelihood to support Trump for president. So, okay, thanks for that. But 32% of respondents said that a conviction would make them less likely to support Trump as opposed to more likely. More than a third of independents said it would reduce their likelihood to support Trump. Okay, good that you don't want to support a criminal. I think that independents in general act more like partisans than most of us think or like yeah. give give credence to. And so many of these people were going to vote for Trump no matter what. And many of these people were going to vote against Trump no matter what. Not every totally. independent is like winnable. And so right. to me, the most compelling numbers when we look at his, his criminal proceedings and how they're going to impact the race come down to Trump voters. What percent of right. Trump voters or, or Republicans that he needs to win over in the Nikki Haley camp? Because he mm. has to win some percent of those. What percent of those people say that a conviction or like ongoing criminal trial would be damning or would preclude them from voting for him. Right. And those are the numbers that I think are the most, give me the most optimism about the direction right. that our political landscape is headed over the next six months as Biden is going up and up and up. The comeback yeah. is real. It is sustained. It is measurable. And then Trump is literally in paying the price for his criminal activity over the last four years. It's not Which, just that he's in court, it's that he's yeah. actually being held to account for the things that we all have watched him do. Yeah. And and Trump, by the way, said that he has no problem testifying. <laughs> I would have no problem testifying. I didn't do anything wrong. It could also make me more popular because the people know it's a scam. It will be good for his fundraising. For sure. For sure. Because news is going to cover Trump's trials left and right. And if he's sitting in, in you know, a witness stand and he's doing the Donald Trump special, it's going to be on air. It's free ad time for him. He doesn't have yeah. to because, you know, Trump supporters, to your point, are going to support him regardless. So, you know, for some people, they might view it and they see it and they're like, oh, my God, he's actually like he's unwell. Like this this person can't leave the country. And if we get some of those Haley voters over, but he loves the microphone. He loves the podium. Yeah. We're back to the Trump show. And we yeah. talked about it last week, but welcome back to the Trump show. He's going to be in the news all the time saying outrageous things and offending people and doing what he does. And that is going to have an impact on the presidential race because he's been notably absent and quiet for the last yeah. six months. Yeah. If you could get a gag over gag order for every single trial that he was in, that would be immensely helpful for my brain. So sticking with our theme of ending kind of bad stories on a high, we are seeing a ton of movement in the Biden camp around preparing for all the different ways that the far right and Trump could try to steal the 2024 election the same way that he tried to overturn and steal the 2020 election. And so they've put together this team that's literally like running drills it's giving soccer practice. Like like legal <laughs> drills? Like like drills where somebody comes up with a circumstance and like hands it over to lawyers and it says like, this just happened. Mem Republican members of the House of Representatives just voted against certifying the election or like certifying the electoral college vote. They're rejecting the votes in these six states or whatever. What do you do next? Like, like, what are you going to file? Who's going to write it? What do you do? Like, like those kinds of. So they can just like, they, it's like literally football and the coach has all the plays. They call the play and they know exactly how to run it. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. that is, and that is what they're building up. They're calling it a superstructure where okay. it, cause it cuts across, like, it's not just the campaign. It's like cutting across multiple different parts of the political ecosystem in order to have all of the pieces in place to prevent mischief, but I'll say like, especially criminal mischief, but, but like right. mischief of any kind in undermining the election before, during, or after. Good. I don't want to like get into like the, the thoughts that keep me up at night sometimes about like this mischief that you refer to but it's good to know that the biden administration and like the government parties are planning 
and being strategic about how they will respond should they need to. I'm reading the notes here, and this is funny to me because I'm obsessed with hanging chads. But Team Biden's in-house counsel and network of outside lawyers are currently prepping these legal strategies for scenarios involving like recounts, etc. And in the words of a Biden official, would make Florida in 2000 look like child's play. So That's what no I want to hear. Chads. No, for sure. Like that was so stressful as like a, I forget how old I was in 2000, but I, oh, I was like a, an eighth grader or something like the hanging chads, the hanging chads. I'm like, how are we like a democracy where we're like literally looking at like scantrons and like for those who are maybe not my age in 2000, there was an insane recount because of this recount in Florida. And imagine like a scantron with like the holes punched out. Like it was a disaster. And this is a Al Gore, core. What you actually need to understand is that this is a core memory for yes, I, yes. <laughs> and as one of her friends, I hear about it every six months. The hanging chads, like what a nightmare. Like, thank God that we're not like doing that anymore. But uh, because of that, Al Gore did not win the election. Yeah, it, it and... decided the election likely in 2000. So to, to your point, it's good news that they're preparing yeah. for these kinds of scenarios, that they're putting the resources, experts and team in place in order to be able to respond quickly. Because as we talked about earlier, the far right has a deep bench of people seeking to exploit every loophole available in order to secure more power. And so we have to be just as prepared to prevent them from doing that and making sure that the system runs as it's supposed to and that whoever gets the most votes, electoral votes, wins. Yes, that is how our democracy works. As part of Trump's reaction to him finally having his feet held to the fire, even a little bit, he had some words about his uh, criminal case starting on April 15th. Uh, you can't have an election in the middle of a political season. We just had Super Tuesday, and we had a Tuesday after Tuesday already, and we had Louisiana the other day. It's giving excuses, excuses. <laughs> Excuses, excuse, excuses. And this is very niche. This is for my millennial women. It's giving concealer as lipstick circa 2005. For the audio only people, like he, he looks like he has concealer on his lips, which was a trend for about 12 months in 2005, 2006. He looks awful. It looks like you ripped a hole in a brown paper bag. <laughs> Literally. It's giving what? Do you have a mouth? <laughs> Sorry, I know this was like about like his campaign. I was like just drawn to the concealer lip. <laughs> yeah, it's giving senior moment. You can't have an election in the middle of a political season. What are you supposed to have? That's the only time you have an election. Yeah, that's when yeah. it's political season. He obviously meant to say a criminal trial. Well, if he is going to have this criminal case proceed against him, it seems like he might be doing a lot of pray mm. about the outcome. I'm proud to be partnering with my very good friend, Lee Greenwood, who doesn't love his song, God Bless the USA, in connection with promoting the God Bless the USA Bible. I think you all should get a copy of God Bless the USA Bible now and help spread our Christian values with others. There you have it. Let's make America pray again. God bless you and God bless the USA. It's giving Christian nationalism. It's giving this prayer is sponsored by literally Mark Wahlberg Viagra. It's also giving he hasn't read the book. Like, I assure you, Donald Trump has never read the Bible. In fact, I know this because four years ago he was interviewed by I forget who. And they were like, you know, what's your favorite verse? You know, what's your favorite book? And he's like, oh, I like both of them. Yeah, it was giving QVC. Brian. Brian, Brian, we Ding! have a, we have a listener voice memo that I'm I'm gonna say is definitely directed at you and not me. I, I feel defended. very attacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I defended. Um, I I'm, Hi, I think this I'm probably is at Cat Moms memo. from Minnesota on yet, Instagram. I, think maybe we're gonna I am it. sending a voice memo in, um, just to push back on a very mild side swipe. Um against lieutenant governors. This was within the greater context of uh, a well-deserved uh, multi-pronged critique of uh, no labels. I, I have no quibble with 
any part of the critique of no labels. But um, I did want to send this voice memo in uh, just in defense, really, of one very specific lieutenant governor. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan of Minnesota is such a badass and an incredible leader. I, uh, I love having her as lieutenant governor of us here in Minnesota. I want her to be our governor. I want her to be our U.S. senator someday. Um, so just, I, I don't, I can't speak to all the other lieutenant governors out there, former or current, but um, just absolute passionate defense of lieutenant governor Peggy Flanagan. Um, and that, that's all for me at Cat Moms from Minnesota. Follow me on Instagram. Thanks, y'all. Love the pod. Love it. Cat Moms from Minnesota. Also Um, valid. A good point that I hadn't thought of, which is like so much of politics is uh, name and face recognition. Knowing someone is generally on the good side of policy. So... T, I came for Lieutenant Governors pretty hard, if you didn't listen to last week's episode. I will say that I generalize my opinion about Lieutenant Governors, and it's not about the people. I actually know a lot of people. I don't know Peggy. Peggy, I'm sure, is fantastic in Minnesota. Let's. I would love to meet her. Lieutenant Governor Peggy to you. Lieutenant Governor. And I'm sure she's fantastic, and maybe she will go on to be governor. That would be great. My issue is not with the individuals because I also think that Antonio Delgado in New York, incredible leader. Mandela Barnes was Lieutenant governor in Wisconsin. Awesome Mm -hmm. leader helped him run for us Senate, but the office itself, I I stand by, I stand by that in most States, it is a useless office. It is the appendix of our elected system of government. And in most cases it's useless. Of course, if the governor is forced to step aside, that changes. And then it's very important who your lieutenant governor is. But for most of the time, in most states, it's kind of useless office. So cat moms, I love you. And thank you for the voice memo. You guys can always, I love getting yelled at in a voice memo. That's like my kink. Let's get into it. Send us more. (laughs) What's going on in your group chat above and beyond lieutenant governors? Well, for me, one thing that was in the group chat, not to bring the vibe down, was that the government did not shut down because we passed a budget um right. which did even make the cut because we've talked about it so many times yeah. but part of the budget that passed included a ban on pride flags flying at embassies overseas that like outside of US embassies in some countries they've been known to fly pride flags along with the american flag as sort of like a way during June or any uh, usually usually during june yeah exactly the one during... allocated pride month <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and like people are pissed is is the bottom line. People are really upset that this policy got included. The other side that didn't get reported on was that we defeated another like 93 anti-LGBT riders that they tried to include in the budget and there were a lot of them were like I would I would argue were much worse and did real harm and like defunded programs that are important to LGBTQ plus people. And so I think that it was the least bad option, but it it, it does still suck. And I I do think of the young queer kid in a country that stigmatizes LGBT identities and he sees they, she sees that flag and it like feels like a calling to a community maybe that they can't reach in that moment, but can someday. And that makes me sad, but I hope that we can pass another bill to undo that in, in the future. What was in your group chat this week? I know you don't want to make this a Survivor chat, but I found out another one of my friends was watching the wrong season of Survivor. So I have to make an announcement to all listeners that we realized at the end of the podcast last recording that Brian and I were talking about two separate seasons of Survivor. I thought I was watching the most recent season. So when we're like shocking, 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 we're talking about two different seasons characters challenges immunity whatever so we wrap and we realize oh my goodness because i'm like season 45 is crazy and brian's like we're on 46 babe (laughs) and then i put two and two together and realized oh my goodness i'm watching the wrong season so my group chat was one me recognizing with another friend that we were watching the wrong season and then eventually this wasn't group chat this was one-on-one brian glennis me texting you because i caught up to the new season but then you Uh texted me 
I did text you and I told you that my mom was dragging you for being on the wrong season and thinking that you were watching in real time. In real time. I was like, wow, like all, wow, I must be watching like a month late because- Can't like, wait to see available. next week. <laughs> so whatever. And then this season I'm like, now I'm caught up because I like just like did admin this weekend. And now I can actually be like, wow, I'm shooketh by this season. Are you ready for a good vibe? I sure am. So our good vibe goodbye for the week is the Biden administration's announcement that they were going to implement this huge policy to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. So what we are seeing is a new rule, which will be the United States toughest limit ever on the emissions from passenger cars and light mm. trucks to help accelerate our clean energy goals and make sure we have clean air and clean water, not just now, but for like many years to come. And we're able to be combating climate change, which right. as we all know is like one of the gravest threats we face. And so this is going to require automakers to really ramp up sales of electric vehicles and slash the carbon emissions from the gasoline the gas-powered vehicles that they're selling. Ultimately, this new rule is going to prevent 7.2 billion metric tons of carbon emissions from entering the atmosphere through 2055. That's like more than the amount That's of major. I ate in Ohio all weekend. And it will also reduce the fine particulate matter and nitrogen oxides, preventing up to 2,500 premature deaths from air pollution annually. That's a lot of people. 2,500 people saved per year. It's a lot. And I don't, I've never once thought about the fine particulate matter in my air. And now I'm going to be every day. This is objectively good, as I call it. Hundo P. Good vibe, baby. Good vibe. Thanks for listening.